Welcome to Living Logistics. Today we take you to Sweden and Madagascar, where schooling and skills training are taking young people from poverty to prosperity. My name is Deborah Friedman. I'm so glad you found us. Right from the start, I can tell you that logistics is a big, multifaceted business with a whole lot of fascinating stories to tell. That car you're driving and all its parts, the coffee you drank this morning, the clothes you're wearing, the device you're listening to right now. Behind all those things, there's a complex journey that includes production lines, warehouses, and transport networks, and engineers, analysts, customs agents, and couriers even teachers, beekeepers, and innovators. In fact, logistics is all about people. In this series about sustainability, you'll hear about some of the many ways logistics experts are making work more meaningful and life more livable. For example, by coming up with clever ways to replace fossil fuels, or by pioneering new apps to help reduce air pollution in congested cities, or by volunteering their expertise and time to improve living standards for entire communities, like in Madagascar. That's where our first story today takes us. Reporter Gabby Pinkner has more. When I used to think of Madagascar, I thought of white, sandy beaches, turquoise seas, and ring-tailed lemurs romping through the jungle. Now I think of warm, smiling, welcoming people, Afro beats, and amazing food. But there's another side to Madagascar. The gap between rich and poor is extreme, and normal people face huge challenges when it comes to health, education and employment. The country is struggling to overcome political and economic challenges, and in the midst of all this, young people are striving to carve out successful futures and turn their career dreams into reality. I was lucky enough to visit Madagascar recently, and I had the chance to find out about the challenges young people face in moving from school into the world of work and meet people from organizations that are giving them a helping hand. I'm here in the SOS Children's Village in Toa Masina. Deepadi HL Group has been working together with this organization for over a decade and runs a unique partnership called Go Teach that helps young people move successfully into the world of work when they finish school. My guide here is an amazing woman called Vane Faremananansu. She's the driving force behind DPD Hotel Group's Go Teach program here in Madagascar and other parts of French-speaking Africa. I've been doing voluntary social work for a very long time. One reason I was drawn to helping others is because I was fortunate to have two wonderful families when I was growing up. I was born prematurely and with a heart defect. Both my adoptive and biological parents helped me overcome my difficulties. I was fortunate to receive a lot when I was growing up, which has made me want to give something back to people less fortunate than me. Fanefa worked for SOS Children's Villages before joining DPDHL Group and helped bring the two organizations together. She's a regular visitor to the Children's Villages. The one we visit in Toa Masina is huge. The land was donated to the organization by the government. It's home to hundreds of children and offers a kindergarten, elementary school and secondary school. There are kitchens, dining areas, family homes, plus a couple of soccer fields that are hugely popular with the soccer-mad Madagascan kids. The village is basic. There's no luxury, but the needs of the children are amply met. Outside the village, things can be very different. Vanefa is taking us to visit a family who are receiving help from the SOS Children's Villages organization. Her work regularly takes her to families like the one we're about to visit in a sprawling slum on the outskirts of Toa As with most roads in Madagascar, it's busy, full of trucks and mopeds and tuk-tuks, and it's very bumpy. We're given a warm welcome by the owner of a tiny house that's home to a family of five. The house is made up of one room with one bed. There's no bathroom or kitchen. There's a blue fridge in the corner, but no electricity. The owner rushes us in and offers us seats. He sits on the bed to tell us his story. He owns his own tuk-tuk, and his wife sells food at a street stand. The family moved to the coastal city of Toa Masina a few years ago when their son became ill. 
They were told that the sea air might help his health, but it didn't. The man looks at the floor as he tells us that his little son died last year. The other children are doing well, however. They're currently at school. The family's fortunes are gradually starting to pick up. Venefa's brought us here to meet this family because they've received help from SOS Children's Villages. As well as the financial help, the organization also ensures the children go to school and offers additional support in the form of a family assistance program. After our visit with the family, Venefa takes us to the family assistance center in Toamasina. Outside, it's hot and humid. Inside the family assistance center, it's dark and cool, and the corridors are filled with the sound of children talking and laughing. <laughs> Just inside the main entrance, there's a small infirmary that takes care of the medical needs of the children and their parents. In the other rooms, we find children sitting at desks, being taught by teachers standing at the blackboard. We get the VIP treatment, and everyone is keen to show us what they can do. The atmosphere is fun and light-hearted, and we even get to see some great dance moves from one of the enthusiastic six-year-olds. As well as providing homes and education for orphans and assisting families in need, SOS Children's Villages and Go Teach also want to help young people make the jump from school into the world of work. As Vanifa explains, that's the ultimate aim of the program. If young people from the SOS Children's Villages don't find a secure job later in life and if they can't be independent, that means the work and efforts of the SOS Children's Villages have been in vain. But it can't all be down to young people to successfully move into the world of work. Companies must also make an effort to attract young people and give them a helping hand. DHL does this by encouraging its employees to volunteer and be mentors at DHL's offices, Venefa introduces us to volunteer Tantalanina Ramarazitov. I volunteer because I would have loved it if someone had helped me when I was in school. The point of school is to learn things like math, French, and English. But there are too few teachers who really motivate and encourage you. Tantalanina is slight and rather delicate looking but she possesses an inner strength. I'm a big fan of comics and superheroes, and because of that, I believe we have to be heroes in real life. That's my philosophy. We can all be superheroes. Yves Andrian Arizon is a real-life superhero in his own way. When the DHL Express country manager hires new employees, he asks that they work as volunteers in their free time. He proudly boasts that in his office... Everyone is a volunteer. I think it's uh, normal because uh, most of people are really a volunteer because uh, it's a year of matter. And uh, we feel that we have some responsibility to do so because we are carrying young future uh, life. But I think there is something deeper than that. We consider each young people looks like our kids and we contribute to Madagascar's success because, again, the young People are the future of Madagascar. It's not just companies like DHL helping young people. In some cases, young people are helping themselves. Venefa takes us to meet a couple of young Madagascan entrepreneurs who've started their own chicken farm. They won a competition called Olympiad, which is organized by SOS Children's Villages and DPDHL Group as a way to encourage young students to come up with business ideas. The winners are given a grant to get their business underway. Feriora Safmaiv grew up in an SOS children's village. Now he lives in his own house and runs his own business. This is the beginning. I now live completely alone. And I notice that I have already changed and grown. I am almost independent now. At first it was difficult being alone. But now it's okay. It just so happens that we're in Madagascar for the launch of the 2019 Olympiad. It's an important event, both for the school and the local community. Representatives from SOS Children's Villages, DHL, local companies, NGOs and the government take their places on the shaded podium in the schoolyard. After speeches, the press are invited to take pictures and ask questions. It's really encouraging to see the close cooperation between charities, business and government, and the children are clearly excited to be part of an event that represents a chance for them to make a difference for their own futures. Some of the children 
have already directly benefited from this close cooperation. 15-year-old Malara Suamanan recently did an internship at DHL in the finance department. It was a real eye-opener for me. It was the first time I had ever done an internship. I was really proud to take my first step into the working world. That first step is an important one, and the earlier it's taken, the better. Young people who don't have the easiest start in life get a boost in confidence by coming into contact with the working world. Meeting children like Mala really brought this home to me and another of my colleagues, Ralph Duovang. He heads the Go Teach program at Deutsche Post DHL Group and works closely with Venefa. This was his first trip to Madagascar, and he was keen to meet the young people that the program supports. In a lot of cases, the young people we work with don't have any family, network or role models. That's where we step in. As well as helping young people in his daily work, Ralph is also a volunteer mentor to young people in Germany in his spare time. Working as a mentor makes me feel incredibly humble, especially when I see the difficult conditions people have to face. During our time in Madagascar, it was clear that much of the population has to rise from very difficult beginnings. The world's fourth largest island faces many challenges, from extreme weather events to life-threatening illnesses, regime changes that greatly destabilize the country, to mass deforestation and a crumbling, often non-existent infrastructure. The gap between rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots, is clear to see. But it was also clear to see that many people are determined to help close that gap. Despite the obstacles, I'm full of optimism. When it comes to the youth of Madagascar, we won't give up. When I think of Madagascar now, I see hope, determination, strength and optimism. And I know that with continued help, support and encouragement, the young people of Madagascar have a very bright future ahead of them. Gabby Pinkner reporting from Madagascar. You're listening to Living Logistics from Bonn, Germany. Gabby mentioned the extreme weather that sometimes devastates Madagascar. In fact, one of the SOS Children's Village's buildings she visited in Choamasina had to be rebuilt after a cyclone tore off the roof. Catastrophe could strike at any time, so it pays to be prepared. That's why DHL Logistics Pros provided disaster management training at an airport in Madagascar last year. It's part of a program in partnership with the United Nations, called Get Airports Ready for Disaster, GARD for short. DHL also has a network of specially trained employees who volunteer their time to be part of a disaster response team, or DRT, when called upon by the UN after a natural disaster, like when Hurricane Dorian decimated the Bahamas in 2019. Gilberto Castro works for DHL Express in Colombia, but he's also one of those employee volunteers closely involved with disaster preparedness and disaster response. Gilberto has been contributing his expertise since 2005 and says every deployment is unique and intense. In your way through a deployment, it's a lot of anxiety, a lot of questions that you have. What are you going to find? How are you going to support? Are the airport working? Is not working? Is the warehouse set up properly? So it's a lot of questions that you have on your way up to a deployment. Afterward, when you do all the job and everything's done properly, will you feel complete? So far, DHL disaster response teams have flown into action on more than 40 occasions after flooding, typhoons, earthquakes, and forest fires in places like Indonesia and India and Puerto Rico and Peru. Chris Weeks is the Director of Humanitarian Affairs at DHL. In uh, 2003, we discovered that the humanitarian system was being underserved at airports when they were trying to bring in humanitarian aid. And we thought that as a company, we could do far more good helping them on the ground at airports rather than giving them flights or giving aid itself. Airports in or near affected areas can become bottlenecks after a natural disaster. Huge volumes of relief workers and supplies come pouring in all at once. It's a tremendous logistics challenge. 
The Guard training program helps airports be prepared. And during disaster response operations, DHL's logistics experts work closely with humanitarian workers, unloading air freight pallets, warehousing relief supplies, conducting inventory, and making sure that the incoming supplies get to the appropriate relief organizations as quickly and smoothly as possible. They're helping, but it's humbling. Here's Gilberto Castro again. You grow as a person, as a professional, and you uh, also helps you to personal, personal life because he takes you to uh, evaluate better what you're doing in every day, appreciate life, appreciate your family more. And every time you go out there for a deployment, you want to make sure you do your best 100% because you know you're helping a lot of people. Sometimes you're helping a whole country. After years of volunteering, Gilberto and Chris have helped countless people in a whole lot of countries. One DRT deployment to Indonesia was particularly heartening, says Chris. It all came together. We had the most successful deployment that I can remember. We operated at Palu Airport offloading the aircraft that were coming in. But we also had a group of ladies from Indonesia who worked at uh, Balikpapan Airport with the air bridge moving cargo up to Palu. It worked so well. A lot of factors make that possible. Strong long-term relations with UN agencies, close cooperation with humanitarian organizations, and a global network of logistics professionals ready to roll up their sleeves to go help. Here's Chris again. For me, the pleasure is being able to apply professional skills from a private company in a humanitarian environment. We concentrated our effort into logistics, what we do best. Logistics expertise is being put to other good uses, too. In Sweden, for example, it's providing new opportunities to people who've been forced to flee their country of origin because of persecution, war, or violence. 2015 was a peak year for migration to Europe, with Sweden receiving the largest number of asylum applications per capita. Thousands of these displaced persons come from war-torn Somalia. Together with SOS Children's Villages, DHL is doing its part to help them integrate into Swedish society by offering a group of young migrants the chance to earn a forklift driver's certificate. It's a qualification that can open doors. Contributor Jennifer Abramson has more. The singers are three young women between 18 and 21 years old. They're part of the huge wave of Somali and Eritrean refugees that have arrived in Sweden in the past decade, fleeing poverty and civil war. But all that seems far away at the moment. Right now, they're standing around a parked forklift in a warehouse, waiting their turn to practice driving. These girls are part of a group of young people spending the week learning the ins and outs of forklift driving and warehouse safety. There are five boys and five girls, ten in total. All but one of them is from Somalia. The class is taught by DHL employees in cooperation with SOS Children's Villages. The program that we provide is the first one of its kind in Sweden. That's Zainab Husseini. When we started, we were the first program in Sweden at all. She herself immigrated to Sweden from Iraq as a young child. Now she runs the mentorship program for SOS Children's Villages in Gothenburg, which is a major port city in the Nordic region. This children's village, it's not a place to live. It's a meeting place, an information hub that offers classes and social services for migrant teens who arrived in the country alone. Every youngster who come to us and are in the program have a mentor. And together with their mentor, they will have a plan for one year. The main focus is what they themselves want to focus on. And we've seen that it's most often the same things. They want to learn that language and they want to have a job or get into the school system in a good way. This is definitely the case for Mohamed Dayib. He's one of the boys taking this forklift driving class. Mohammed speaks some English, but in most of our conversations, his SOS mentor, Zainab, translated for him. How did you find SOS Children's Village? Uh, I had a friend who was a participant in the program, and he told me, you are welcome to come if you want to. Mohammed's story is pretty intense. He left Somalia at age 14, traveling on a fake passport. He made his way to Sweden via Turkey. Now he's 18 years old and a Swedish citizen. He has managed to bring 12 other family members from Somalia. 
He recently moved to a town about 60 kilometers away from Gothenburg. So his daily commute to this class requires three different buses. It takes an hour and a half each way. But he says it's worth getting up early to get here for the 9 a.m. start. Where I live now, it's a big industry city, which means that if I get the license, I'm going to be able to work extra or even take other jobs in the future. So it's a really good opportunity for me. If you should go this training in another place, you have to pay. And we who come here alone uh, maybe don't have that kind of money, so it's great that we can do it for free and also that we can focus on our future. There are schools that offer this certification, but they charge for it. And some are what you might call unscrupulous. That's according to Magnus Cato. He is DHL's lead trainer for the week-long program. And he's upset about companies that take advantage of the immigrants. Just a side note, when Magnus talks about forklifts, he often refers to them as trucks. There are businesses that are not as serious. They sell two-day courses to kids for like 2,500 Swedish, which is about 250 euros. So they have six, seven hours training, which is unbelievable to me because I know how much effort I put in the theoretical part, which is half of the courses, two and a half days, and the rest is two and a half day driving the, the trucks. In these schools, they maybe drive a forklift five minutes. Magnus is 62, a huge guy with a goatee and a big laugh. In his free time, he likes to work the pit crew at drag races. For DHL, he's in charge of maintenance at a warehouse near the Danish border. And he's a driving and safety instructor. When DHL asked him to teach this class, it was an easy yes. I thought it was a very good idea because of the situation with the immigrants, how hard it is for them to get involved in our working market. I'm an old guy. If my experience can help them to get a good start into the daily life, why not? Magnus and his assistant David Nordstrom teach theory in a room above the warehouse. This class is not a walk in the park. Last year it was offered for the first time. Twelve students took it and just nine of them passed, most of them on the second try. The biggest problem, Magnus says, is the language. All migrants to Sweden are given Swedish classes, but it's a tough language to learn. The training I do is in Swedish, and it's hard for me to explain the technical parts of the trucks, etc., and make them understand and realize that they have to answer and make a test on Friday and pass the test, hopefully. Man tycker det är fånigt, fillet, fillet och skriva ner och allting. Pallet sizes, vehicle types, load distribution. The kids manage to stay focused through a long morning of teaching. But it's clear that they enjoy the driving part more. They're doing really good today. Yeah? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that they are so eager to learn. <laughs> uh, this is a good day, yeah. And now they are expecting to have some fun with the forklifts. It's the reward of them working hard. <laughs> For most of these youngsters, operating a forklift is their first experience driving any vehicle. We don't expect them to have driving slides, no. No, we don't. I mean, they come from places, they don't even have roads, they don't even ride a bicycle. This is day three for you? Yeah, yeah, this is day three. Are you confident that it will be good today? (laughs) Yes, I'm very confident. I'm very, very confident. Now it's Mohammed's turn. His first time driving what's known as a reach truck. On, off. Nu de, de parkera. Nu de off. Oh, de parkera. Nej, nu de parkera. Okay. These are small forklifts that have hydraulic arms that reach up and put away pallets or pull goods from high up in the warehouse racks. Later today, the students will practice passing an oncoming vehicle in the narrow aisles between the racks. Tomorrow, they'll work on moving pallets stacked high with goods. But first, they need to learn the controls. They practice moving the machines forward, reversing, turning, circling, and coming to a stop. Mohammed gives it a try. So, how was it? It felt okay. This forklift doesn't feel so uh, difficult driving. Different than the one yesterday? Then a little later, also. 
Uh, this one was easier than the one we drove yesterday. But of course, DHL aims to teach more than just driving. The most important thing is that the young people understand the dangers and responsibilities of warehouse work. It's a job where small mistakes can cost lives. Late in the day, Magnus and David show the class how to change a battery in a forklift. It's a very dangerous procedure. The battery is quite heavy. You can see here it weighs 939 kilos. So it's almost a ton. And it's all lead, it's all acid, and it's all explosive gas. So this, this is very explosive. The safety is the main focus for DHL, and safety must be the main focus for me too, because we don't want to be in a situation where our employers have fear to go to the working place and expect something to happen today. Uh, they should feel safe when they go to our warehouses and have fun at work, I think. Spending the day with these young people, it's clear they relish this opportunity. Most of them carry huge responsibilities, working nights and weekends to support themselves and their families. They're aware that starting a new life in Sweden is a chance many others didn't get. And if the aim of programs like this one from DHL is to help these migrants feel at home in their new country, then it seems to be working. It's like Mohammed says. So that's why we like in Sweden. So you plan to stay in Sweden? Yes, yeah, no, no, Sweden is it's my first country. I feel like I am Swedish. <laughs> it feels good. That was Jennifer Abramson reporting from Sweden and now joining me in the studio. Welcome, Jen. Hi, Deborah. Jen, that forklift certificate can really make a difference for young migrants and their future. Yeah, it does. It's not a job training program per se, but the kids who earn the certificate can use it to look for work wherever they want. This course is just one aspect of a larger social project. DHL employees in Sweden are also helping these young people with their homework, and they hold what are called mingle parties, where everyone gets to know each other and the kids can practice speaking Swedish. Wow, those sound like great ways to put social integration into practice. It is. I mean, it's really important in the wider context of the current migrant crisis in Europe. In fact, the folks in Sweden hope to extend the forklift driving classes even further to other people looking to get a good start in Europe. I spoke to Alex Hislop about that. Alex is from DHL Sweden, and he's the person who started this cooperation with SOS Children's Villages in the first place. The plan is to actually start to export this as, an, as a concept, as a cookie cutter, to run it to in other countries within the Nordics, but also elsewhere, because it's relatively easy to do. And knowing that DPDHL has this relationship and partnership with the SOS Children's Villages in around 47 different countries means that there are a lot of children and youth that we can potentially tap into. Alex mentioned 47 countries, but I've heard that it's now up to 50. And the program combines goodwill with very practical skills that can help people find good work. Wow. Thank you for sharing that story, Jen. It's another great example of people using their logistics expertise and commitment to make a positive difference in communities and people's everyday lives. You've been listening to Living Logistics. I'm Deborah Friedman. Join us next week when we go to Rotterdam. If you liked today's episode, be sure to rate us, share it with your friends and family, and subscribe. You can find Living Logistics on your podcast app of choice or head on over to our website, dpdhl.com slash podcast, where you can find links and more details about the stories you heard today. Once again, that's dpdhl.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>